the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. O God, work in our hearts that we may indeed be rich toward you now and always. Amen. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, You can thank me later for not preaching on the Colossians text, talking about how anger is a sin. Doesn't that seem like our major vice right now? Politically, at least, we sure are enjoying it. Well, remember that uh, comedian Joan Rivers? She could be a bit much, but she could also be Uh, quite funny. As I uh, consider this gospel story today and preaching on this gospel story, I think of her uh, catchphrase, can we talk? Can we talk? Can we talk directly and honestly and frankly about what this story says to you and me? Can we talk Because this story seems to ask us to consider some rather difficult subjects around money. And it seems, well, it seems, I I don't know, it seems like the kind of uh, thing we might want to avoid. And for sure it seems like the kind of thing that uh, a minister might want to avoid because it seems to push us to that realm where many accuse church leadership of being a little too interested in money, huh? And of course, uh, I like it when people give money to the church because then the church can pay me. And so there's this odd conflict of interest in there, or uh, I think the word, I think it's conflict of interest. I think that's what it is. Um, Well, This is one of those stories where at the beginning of the week I look and see that this is uh, what we're going to hear on Sunday and I and I get anxious and I kind of check my calendar. Am I going to be on vacation next Sunday or am I going to be here? Can we talk? Because I think when we get to the end of the conversation, while we may not be entirely certain that we wanted to have the talk, we might be surprised where it's gone and where Jesus leaves us. And after all, we might be interested to see that Jesus wants to lead you to healing and life. Jesus tells a simple parable. A farmer has a good harvest and embarks then on a building project to secure it all and looks ahead to some well-earned R&R. And then his life is demanded of him and everything takes on new perspective. It's interesting. Now, you know, as I prepare, I read all sorts of commentators and and people talking about this and preaching on it. And all sorts of people are really kind of hard on the farmer. And so I want to defend him a little bit because take note, uh, Jesus does not say that the guy was in any way a crook or did anything 
dishonest. Look at the parable. Jesus says, quote, uh, his land pr- produced, quote, abundantly. His land produced abundantly. Isn't that nice term? Now, I kind of think if the farmer had told you what happened, he might tell the story this way. Through excellent farming practices, good crop rotation, wisely planting the grain, and a bunch of really hard work. A good farmer produced a bumper crop. Nothing bad, nothing. He's not growing anything illegal, huh? He's not tipping scales. He has simply had an excellent harvest. And Jesus tells us that in the face of his excellent harvest, the man engaged in an interesting business conversation. But he doesn't have any conversation partner does he he's talking to himself and the conversation topic is all about him huh here's what the parable says and he thought to himself what should I do for I have no place to store my crops then he said I will do this I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Do you know how many times he says I and my? Eleven times. It's all about him. There's nobody else in the picture. That's what people might call eye problems, huh? What happened to God's promise that you are blessed to be a blessing? Where are his neighbors? Doesn't his good harvest mean good things for those who live around him as well? But even deeper still, he has come to see his good fortune as bearing promise not for good rest, but for his very soul. I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Can we talk? Because this story, which seems rather simple in one sense, may bear a message much deeper than simply you should spend less time at the office. Jesus tells his hearers and he tells you and me, one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. I think you all already knew that, didn't you? I think we all all know that, but there's something that happens, something that takes place between the knowing and the doing, and over and over we lose our way and we sort of wonder what on earth happened. Well, I thought the story was about money, which we're not sure we want to talk about all that much. It really is about relationships. The rich farmer had land that produced abundantly, and this was a gift, a gift to the farmer for sure, but it also has the potential to be a gift to the community. And more the farmer sees his good fortune as somehow reflecting not on his bank account, but on his very soul. Remember he said, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Reading commentary by one preacher, he really did some neat stuff with this aspect of relationship. And I really liked it. And he has open space for comments. And somebody commented to him and started by saying peace. In other words, he says, I I don't want to attack you. Peace, he says. But let me say, I'm always suspicious of first world theologians trying to diminish this parable's indictment on greed, materialism, and individualism. I appreciate your words about the need of community and importance of justice in terms of good works for the sake of our neighbor, not for salvation. My only critique is that, in my humble opinion, 
Isolation is not the main issue. Greed is. Isolation in the parable is a byproduct of greed. Isn't that great? I love hearing these different perspectives that... Well, I don't love it because it's a little hard on me too. But I know that's good. I know that's helpful insight. And it's interesting to think about this. Yes, I think the issue at hand is the farmer needs to be called to relationship. The gift of a bumper crop is a gift for the whole community. And he needs to know that. But this is also true. The issue at hand is greed. And I'm struck that the problem with greed is that it discounts and ignores and uses my neighbor. I'm still surprised I didn't win the lottery yesterday. I was sure I was going to win. And Laura insist that you have to buy a ticket to win. (laughs) I tell people, never marry a doctor. It's difficult. You know that mathematically your chances of winning are the same whether or not you buy a ticket. You know that, don't you? (laughs) Talk to any mathematician. My first call, I served in the St. Paul Area Synod, and Bishop Lowell Erdahl was an interesting character. And he would say that every time he went into the gas station, he would ask the teller if they had ever sold the winning lottery ticket. And always they said no. And he would always say, interesting, huh? (laughs) Then he would also quote, I think, Leo Tolstoy, but I can never keep Leo Tolstoy and... Dostoevsky apart because they're both from the same half of the world. Isn't that hilarious? They're both from Russia. You know, that's like saying they're both from North America. I can't, you know. Um, Tolstoy said that a lottery is immoral because I am planning to profit at my neighbor's loss. When someone sells you something, They sell you a product and you get something in return. A lottery, I'm trying to take your money. That's not in the sermon here. (laughs) It all goes back to my annoyance that Laura pointed out you have to buy a lottery ticket to win. I mean, what does it mean that a minister of the gospel has a good idea of what he would do if he won a billion dollars? That's greed. It is. It's brokenness. To think I need more when I have as much as I have. Um, So Jesus says, be on guard against greed. That's interesting language. Be on guard. It's not like, um, oh, I got that taken care of. Now I'm not greedy. Be on your guard. Greed removes us from others. Greed destroys community. It makes my eye problem worse and worse, and I lose track of my neighbor whom God has called me to love. And as Colossians says, which I said I'm not preaching on, greed is idolatry. And idolatry sneaks up on us, and the next thing we know, we're putting our neighbors last and ourselves first. It happens over and over and over. Be on guard against greed. And this interesting thing where um, you fool this very night, your life is being demanded of you. And I like the preacher who said, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that the person is going to die. And here's how they want to mean that. 
I once heard a, a theologian speak about how the gods we construct are way more demanding than our God. And he talked about going to a car show. And he saw this guy's car that he had fixed up. And he was talking to him and he leaned on the car. And the guy said, please don't touch the car. I have to polish that again. Do you drive your car very much? Well, no, I have, it has an original windshield. And if it gets a rock chip, it's not as valuable anymore. And I have to take care of this, and I have to take care of that, and I have to take care of this. You see, our idols are way more demanding than the God who desires you for you life and salvation and neighbors and love. Be on your guard against greed because it hurts our neighbors. And you know what? It hurts you as well. And so I look at this text on Sunday, uh, a week ahead of time, and I go, oh, am I going to be on vacation? And then by Thursday, I go, I'm glad I'm going to be here on Sunday. With these people God has given me to love. A bunch of greedy people. (laughs) Who are greedy like me. And I'm so grateful for this story. Because we know the one who told the story. His life was demanded of him, huh? And he gave his life to give us a way forward into the life to which we're called. On guard against greed, eyes wide open for all the opportunities God gives you to love. Thanks be to God. Amen.